mercy, Christ have mercy. Friends, hear the good news. Scripture has promised as far as the east is from the west, north from the south, so far does God remove our sins from us. In Christ we are made new beings, open to the leading of the Spirit, sent forth to love and to serve. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Praise God. Please be seated. David, could I get you to move this chair just a little bit more in the center? And I would like to have all the children please come forward, if you will. That's great. Thank you. Um, just sit around this chair. That would be awesome. I have something very special to tell you today. Okay, how many of you remember being told stories, or maybe you still are told stories, right? I have a very special story to tell you. Does anybody know what happened this past Thursday here at Woods? Do you know that this church turned 110 years old? That's really old, isn't it? Yeah. Well. Once upon a time, a long time ago, whenever, 110 years ago, when this church was born, we had a big celebration and we built this church because the church was born and it was made ready for all the people to come. The church wasn't built like people are. It wasn't born like people are because it was built by people with hammers and nails and saws. So I'm going to ask you if you would take, who wants to hold hammers? Okay, can you do that? Okay, just hold on to it for a minute. And who can hold on to this one? This is, you know what this is? A saw <laughs> and a level, right guys? Okay, there we go. Well, when this church was 110 years old, I have a question. Do you know anybody that is that old? Yeah, no, it's hard to get there. Well, when Wood's church was six years old, someone was born who is here in this congregation today and we're celebrating his birthday. Any guesses on how old that makes him? 104. Oh my gosh, what? And four. Yes, uh huh. Have you ever seen anybody who was 104 years old? Well, you're about to. <laughs> His name is Charlie Phelps, and he is turning 104 years old. Well, because the church was six at that time, Charlie and the church got to be really good friends. And they taught him about Jesus. What was one of Jesus' favorite things to talk about? What? Being kind? What else? Yeah. He talked about God a lot. He talked about loving each other and helping each other. So Charlie decided that it would be a good idea to make sure that everyone took good care, care of his friend, the church. So he did. And 
When he was growing up, he took care of a lot of trees. He liked to work with trees a lot. And he knew that as woods grew up, it was going to need a lot of things fixed. I mean, what happens when you get old? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, she's, she's being very careful. Things start to, things start to break down. Yes, they do. And that's true with the church as well as with people. And, and for people, we get to go to the doctors to get fixed. But do you know who the church goes to to get fixed? Who? The repair men and the repair women and what? And God helps. Yeah, God fixes those part of the church too. But do you know what? We have some people here who are called the rehabbers. And these are people who take care of the fixing of the things in the building and around the building. And then we have a whole team of gardeners who take care of everything out in the garden. Well, you know what those buildings are that are outside the church here? Ever seen those sheds? You know what those are? Yeah, no? Well, those things that you're holding in your hands, the saws and the paintbrushes, everything is stored out there. And it, that's kind of like a place where the rehabbers and the gardeners go to get all their tools to do this work. Anybody know who Santa Claus is? Yeah, who's Santa Claus? Um, he, gives you toys. he gives you toys? That's right. What else? He flies through the air on the sled, right? Yeah, yeah, that's Santa Claus. Santa Claus also has a workshop. Yeah. Yes, and he builds a house, right? And he does all kinds of builds the toys, and he makes things, but you know, and he has some helpers. Anybody know what Santa's helpers are called? Elves, Elves right. Well, anybody know what Charlie Phelps's workshop helpers are called? Rehabbers, that's right. Could all the rehabbers stand up out here so we can see you? Stand up. and you've seen, I've got three birds outside. Their names are Gloria, Hallelujah, and Amen. Those birds live in the woods and the gardens and the chipmunks are out there and that's because of the garden team who does all that work. Can you gardeners stand up so we can see you? Where are our gardeners? There we go. So, do you know who started all of this? This is Charlie Phelps because he has a workshop and he has kind of like elves. We don't really want to call them elves, but Charlie Phelps is here. Very good. I couldn't have paid you to do that better. <laughs> Charlie Phelps, um, we thought that it would be a good idea if we sang to you and had you come up. Can Charlie stand up? Charlie, they've never seen somebody 104 years old. <laughs> Look at him. There he is. Can you hold this? One of you hold that. Okay, Charlie, you just stay standing. Can somebody hold this? And I'm going to have you all come line up here on the steps. All right, can you line up on the steps? Yep, go ahead. One of you hold this. Good, okay, and turn around. All right, and you are going to lead the congregation in singing happy birthday. Can you do that? You can just stand there and hold that, and you're doing great. And I'm going to, what's her name? Can you turn around and just lead them? Do like this so that you can lead everybody. Happy birthday.
a gift for you. It's a very special thing that the rehabbers put together. Santa's is called Santa's Workshop. We are naming, can we put the slide up out here? The Phelps Workshop. And this is going up out there just for you. Okay, thank you all. If, if you want to, you can probably touch him if you're real careful as you go by. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? Very good, very good, all right. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> okay, you all can go back to your seats. Charlie, my first grandson is named Charlie, and that's, I, th I hope he has the life that you had. So. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. The first reading is from Psalm 16, and this is David's statement of his confidence in God. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, my soul rejoices, my body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Here ends the first reading. So building on to the sentiment of the psalm, it's an actual event that embodies that. It's a reading from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scripture. This is a story of Elijah and Elijah has an encounter with God. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 19. We'll be reading verses 9 to 16. Listen for God's word today. Now at that place, Elijah came to a cave and he spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, have thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. 
When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And again he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And then the Lord said to Elijah, go, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king of Aram. Also you shall anoint Yehu, son of Nimsi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel Mehulah, as prophet in your place. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what happened to Elijah? How did this mighty prophet end up hiding inside a cave on a mountaintop? One chapter before this, Elijah was literally boldly facing off against 450 prophets of the false fertility god Baal of that region. Elijah won that contest, but when Ahab and Jezebel heard about his victory, a death sentence was pronounced against him. And so Elijah panicked and he ran. And he ran and made it all the way to the far south of the kingdom. And he climbed a mountain there and hid in a cave. And that's where we find him in today's passage. Elijah felt that he was all alone, that he was the only follower of God left in the land. As he saw things, everyone in the northern kingdom of Israel had forgotten God, torn down God's altars, and either chased away or killed God's prophets everyone but him. He was ready to give up. He'd lost hope, and he basically said that when God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? At Austin Presbyterian Seminary in Texas, one of their professors recently retired, a man named David Johnson. Now, Dr. Johnson was a funny guy. His students often wrote down the comments he made in class. One of his sayings was, when life hands you lemons, make margaritas, because then the only question will be what to do with all those darn lemons. <laughs> but in a more serious moment, he was asked, what is the opposite of faith? And he thought for a while and then replied, I don't think the opposite is denial or doubt. It may be despair, as Kierkegaard thought, but I'm beginning to think that the opposite of faith is self-involvement. If faith is outward looking, directed to loving God and loving our neighbor, then perhaps the opposite of that is when the gaze becomes hopelessly inward looking, self-absorbed. Maybe this type of self-involvement feels as if you're hiding from the world in a cave like Elijah. But if so, then the next question is still just as applicable. What are you doing here? Twice in that cave, God spoke to the prophet and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah was quick to list off all the reasons why he was so distraught and troubled. But instead of trying to talk him out of his despair, God simply said, come out of the cave. I'm going to pass before you. Now, I need to give you a little Bible trivia background to help understand what happened next. The mountain where Elijah chose to hide wasn't just any old mountain. It was Mount Horeb, but that mountain is also known as Mount Sinai, the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. And remember how God appeared to Moses and the Israelites when they were fleeing oppression in Egypt. First, God's power was seen in a mighty wind that blew and separated the waters so they could pass through the Red Sea. And next, God's power was seen in a pillar of fire that literally led them through the wilderness. And then when they got to Mount Sinai and Moses and the elders were told to ascend the mountain, an earthquake shook the ground and caused the rocks to tumble down from below. So it's no surprise 
that once more on Mount Sinai, Elijah witnesses the power of God in wind and fire and earthquake. But after all of those special effects have passed over, then something totally different happened. Now, no Bible scholar really knows how to translate verse 12 of this passage because all the words have multiple meanings. And so in the King James versions, it says that after the wind and the earthquake and the fire, Elijah heard a still small voice. The New Revised Standard Version we just heard described it as the sound of sheer silence. And the Common English Bible says there was a sound, thin, quiet. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to find a place in which we are surrounded totally by silence. I, I tried it when I was writing this sermon, and I paused and stopped. But even in that moment, I could still hear the computer running and whirring away. I could hear the air conditioner kick on to cool the house. I heard some birds out in the garden. Sometimes if you've ever gone deep into a cave, you can, in those spots, experience absolute darkness and in many cases, absolute stillness. And it's funny because in those moments, there's almost a weight to the silence around you. You see and you hear nothing but you can feel its reality. What happened is that Elijah felt something in that sheer silence. It's like he felt the very reality of God, the, the nearness of the one who is the creator and sustainer of all life. There was a voice, a sound, a, a thinness where heaven and earth came together around him. Now, words fail to capture it, but it was enough in that moment to shake Elijah out of his funk, to get him to stand up and to step outside of that cave at last. God called him to step out into the world again, to once more be God's prophet, to change the world for good. Several years ago, uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman wrote a book called the social construction of reality. Now they wrote about how our life together at every level is shaped by what we would call common sense knowledge. The knowledge that we share that helps one another get through our days as best we can. Now a good example of this common consensus, common sense knowledge, are traffic lights. There are not enough police officers in the world to ensure that every car stops at every red light. So as drivers, all of us, with the exception of a bunch of people in New Jersey, <laughs> know that red lights mean stop and green lights mean go. Now common sense tells us we should all accept those rules. And if we accept those rules while we're driving home, it usually means we get there safe despite dealing with crowded and busy roadways. Every society on earth depends on common knowledge. So when things happen to shake and challenge what is the communal wisdom, it sends a shock wave, a shock wave that's felt in our very being. It's like people everywhere are suddenly running red lights and we just don't know what to do about it. The past couple weeks have had several examples of these shock waves that have challenged what it means to live in American society. And so it's right for us as people of faith to take time to think about these things. The first one was the common wisdom that you're able to walk into a public space in America. And if there's a problem that happens, that only the police officer has a weapon to keep everyone safe. But the Supreme Court, in striking down New York's 100-year-old law restricting the carrying of concealed weapons, now calls that into question when we gather in our public arenas. And it puts police officers at risk as they try to quickly sort out which person with a gun in their hand is the real threat. It's like running red lights now with firearms. 
In the same way, number two, the common knowledge in this country is that there's to be an orderly transition of power from one democratically elected leader to another. But the January 6th hearings have exposed willful attempts to run that red light, to break a 200-year-old precedent as one man tried to hold on to power at any cost. And number three, the overturning of Roe v. Wade ran over a 50-year precedent that acknowledged a woman's inherent ability to make decisions about her own body. The recent ruling makes it seem like abortions are simply a, a whim, a matter of impetuous convenience, when nothing could be further from the truth. It tries to legislate that all life begins at conception when it's true that many people of faith, many Christians, many Jewish, many Muslim families do not hold that as part of their faith tradition. What happened is that that ruling took a very complex issue and drove full speed through a red light of mutual forbearance. And it's dividing our country further and literally putting thousands of women's health at risk. Now, I know all three of these are complicated topics, and we may not all agree on the details, but in times like this, no one is well served by pablum from the pulpit. We need to find ways to talk faithfully about what's going on in our nation and in our world as people committed to the gospel of Christ. Because my fear is that all of these current events, plus COVID, plus fears of recession, will cause us to pull in and become self-involved, like Elijah began hiding in a cave. My fear is that we too will lose faith, that we'll grow discouraged, and that the young people around us will also give up on their God. So my prayer is that Elijah's story becomes our story, that we too learn to quiet down our troubled spirits, and actively seek the spirit of a loving God. And the reality is that in that moment, there is a deep silence that longs to offer us words of comfort. It's the quietness of that place where heaven and earth literally come together. And it's the reassurance that we all stand on solid ground, on Christ, the rock of our salvation. Elijah realized precisely that. And that's why he stood up and he stepped out of his cave. And then God gave him instructions and told him, I want you to go back north, retrace your steps. I want you to anoint a new king in Israel to replace Ahab and Jezebel. And I want you to anoint a new prophet, Elisha, who will continue my work in the years to come. God had Elijah step out so that a common faith might be restored, so that a common commitment to love and justice would rule over that land, so that there would be no reason to hide in caves or be afraid anymore. That same message was echoed by Christ Jesus when he too went up on top of a mountain, when he too stood beside Moses and Elijah and the disciples were overcome with fear there on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they wanted to stay there. They wanted to build booths. And Jesus said, no, don't bother with that. Follow me. Let's go back down the mountain and let's go into the world. What does it look like when we step out of our caves? It looks like being a church like this. It looks like ordaining elders and deacons who are freely giving of themselves and their wisdom and their experience to make sure this church is here for today and tomorrow. It looks like a team of Woodsworth volunteers building a house in Catanning. It looks like Sunday school teachers carefully teaching the words of Christ to our children. It looks like when you pray for someone who's grieving or sad or depressed. It means not running red lights, but working for a society in which we value the common good and humbly recognize that our laws must protect all of us at risk 
or they run the risk of protecting none of us. And so we're called to step out of our caves, to be people of faith. And that call is for each of us as Presbyterians, as modern day prophets, as people of faith, and as followers of Christ this day and always. Thanks be to God. Amen. portion of your offering today goes in part to support local hunger programs such as the Herondale Lunch Program and the SPAN Food Pantry that serves those in need in Anne Arundel County. Please join me in prayer. We pray our gifts will be used to extend your kingdom in our land. May you, the God of all grace, who has called us into eternal glory by Christ Jesus, make us holy strong and filled with peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Sí, sí, sí. Let us pray. Lord God, you call us out into the world to be your loving and caring followers. Today, as we will ordain and install new elders and deacons to serve in leadership here at Woods, we ask your blessing upon them and upon the ministry they will offer. Give them wisdom and give them grace to listen and to make faithful and grace-filled decisions. Along with them, let us seek always to live Christ-like lives ourselves, caring for others and supporting those who are sick and weary and who are grieving. We pray for all who must endure conflict and who are challenged by political decisions that deeply impact their personal lives. We pray for all who seek resolution and peace, whether in our own nation or in places where war and violence are daily expectations. Help us, O oh God, to be the voice of the church and to find balance in our choices that is respectful of others' realities. We continue to pray for those who mourn the loss of the lives of loved ones the loss of control, rights, memory, mental health, and physical stamina. Let us trust in your mercy and your ongoing presence and the goal of your kingdom here on earth. As we pray for specific individuals this morning, we do so knowing that their lives carry ripple effects out into our community and into the lives of others. We know that when we pray for one, we implicitly pray for many. We ask your protection and your guidance for those who serve on Woods work and those who offer care in so many places, in hospitals and in doctor's offices, those who come to serve those who are in need, putting themselves in harm's way. This morning we pray for Dan Atkinson and David Corbin and Louise Jobes, Edie Segree and Joe and Connie Wines, Wayne and Judy Boswell and Carolyn Decker, Ada Martin, Marie Sheldon and Jeff Wolf Wood. We pray for Ronald Carter and Julie Gallimore, Marion and Stu Miller. We pray for Debbie Bradley and Pete Cooper and Frank Gathman. We pray, O oh God, for Corinne Minton and Charlene Van Meter. This morning, we ask your blessing and your presence and comfort on those who grieve. Janine Blake on the death of her father, Thomas Bern. We pray for the family and friends of Shirley Kimberly and the family and friends of Marilyn Sickles. At the same time, we grieve, we give you thanks in celebration for the birth of a granddaughter to Ryan and Melissa Johnson. We pray, oh God, that you would continue to be with all of our mission partners and coworkers around the world and ask that you hear our prayers for those that we pray for in our hearts and that we pray for on our prayer lists. And hear us now as we pray together the prayer that your son taught us saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. The session of Woods Church now ordains Pam Blumenthal, Sally Sashi, 
and Paul Self to the office of Elder and Joel Cahoon, Janet Flynn, Catherine Kissam, Michael Weber, Leslie Wintz, and Delight Yoganovich to the office of Deacon. The session also installs to active service those who have been formally ordained, Elders Bill Brooks, Bill Daniel, Laura Nelson, and Dave Wernicke, and Deacons Andy Borland, Katie Borland, Debbie Bradley, Delia Edelman, Brenda Rogie, and Jean Zemo. All right, folks, I'll have you actually face Nancy and I for a second. I'm so grateful that Doug got all of your names. <laughs> So part of being an officer of this congregation as an elder or a deacon is that you answer ordination questions similar to the ones that Nancy and I answered when we were ordained. This is also for some of you that are watching uh, remotely at home that couldn't be with us physically. So I invite you to answer the following questions required from our book of order and our church constitution. Friends, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledging him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of our Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of the church as being authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? Do you? Will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you? And will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? All right, we're over halfway, hang on. Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? And will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Now to the elders here and those that are at home, will you be a faithful elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline and serve in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And for the deacons here and out there, will you be faithful deacons teaching charity and urging concern and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your own ministry, will you try to show the love and peace of Jesus Christ, will you? And to the congregation, everyone who as members of this church do you accept Pam Blumenthal, Bill Brooks, Bill Daniel, Laura Nelson, Sally Sashi, Paul Self, David Warnicke, Andy Borland, Katie Borland, Debbie Bradley, Joel Cahoon, Delia Edelman, Janet Flynn, Catherine Kassam, Brenda Rogie, Mike, <laughs> Mike <laughs> Weber, and Leslie Wentz, Delight Yukonovich, and Jean Zemo. Whew, that's a lot of you. As elders and deacons, do you and will you guide, be guided by them um, as they lead us to the way of Jesus Christ? And if so, will all of you please say, we do. We do. And do you and we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, answer, we do. Now in days past, we would have invited all those that have been ordained to come forward, but for COVID reasons, we're gonna have people keep their distance. We're also not gonna have you kneel, so that's probably a good thing for some of us. <laughs> but I do invite all the, there to extend a hand towards these officers of the church as a sign of the church sending the Holy Spirit upon them. And hear us as we pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us because you've called forth leaders in every age to serve you 
and equip them with the gifts for service. In the church, these are deacons and elders and pastors who serve together that your whole people may be equipped for ministry and built up into the unity of Christ. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit upon the incoming elders, upon Pam and Bill and Bill and Laura and Sally and Paul and David. May they be faithful elders in the church. Nourish them in the life of the Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion and guide them in governance on this session and in every church court that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. And for the deacons, God of grace, pour out your spirit on Andy and Katie, Debbie, Joel, Delia, Janet, Catherine, Brenda, Mickey, Leslie, Delight, and Jean. May they be faithful deacons in your church. Give them openness to the Spirit's leading that they may see and serve wherever there is any need and give them the mind of Christ who did not grasp at greatness but emptied himself to serve all. Loving God, may we together proclaim the good news, make disciples, be light and leaven, sharing your bread and offering cups of water, washing one another's feet. Make us strong in Christ to live as your people and show forth your saving love in the world. May all God's people say, amen. amen. Friends, you are now elders and deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry that your whole life may bear witness to the crucified and risen Lord. Friends, please welcome these new officers to our church as they go forth to serve. Thank you all. Blessings. So we've given Charlie a head start. But the, the task for you now is to go forth. Go to the reception and spend time with Charlie. If you have a question or a prayer concern, you can come forward and meet with Pat, our Stephen minister for the day. Take part in the reception. Come back for the second service if you choose. It's important to sign on to Zoom if you're not gonna come back for the congregational meeting. But let us be a church together 
at that gathering at 1215. But even more so, let us be the church out in the world. God sends you there that you might be light and hope and love. And God will provide all you need, so be not afraid. And may the grace of God, the love of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and give you peace this day and forevermore. May God's people say, Amen. Amen.